Hi everyone, welcome back. Let's get into it. So this time around, we're going to see if we can do a flyby of the moon and possibly even uh, land on it. So what's happened since last time is I've installed a couple of new mods. One of them is the RCS Build Assist, which is this really neat thing. Uh, sorry, the RC is build aid. It allows us to uh, see whether any of our engines are applying a torque. So that is, if their forces are offset from our center of mass. That is really, really handy. And it also is a great help when adding um, RCS thrusters. The other one is the uh, WASD editor camera, which when you enable it, allows you to move around the scene. Um, and so you're able to get much better sort of pinpoint accuracy when you're constructing things. This is really useful stuff. Um, although sometimes I just prefer to stay with the default camera. So I just have a hotkey, just results, resets to the uh, stock camera. Anyway, on to our contracts. So uh, we have a fly by the Mun mission and a return to Kerbin from a fly by of the Mun mission. Uh, if we finish both of those, we will get 160,000 credits plus 104,000 bonus for finishing them both. So let's have a look at what craft we already have and will any of these get us to the moon? And I don't think so. Let's have a look at our candle. Okay, so um, this is nowhere near enough. So we'll start with this one as a basis. Well, we'll start with the command pod as a basis, and we'll build on top of that. Well, let's have a look. So we have some uh, fuel tanks, which is always useful. This is just fuel. We need liquid oxygen as well. Okay, so we have the rocket fuselage. That's fine. Um, do we have any decouplers? We do. We have decouplers. Beautiful. Okay, so one of these with an engine under it should be able to land on the moon. Um, so the Reliant liquid fuel engine has an ISP of 310 seconds. The Swivel has 320 seconds ISP in vacuum, so we'll use that one. Um, we'll need some legs. Do we have any? We have some legs. With some very tiny, tiny legs. Okay. Yeah, that is not going to sit on the surface of the moon at all. So what can we do instead? We'll just put the swivel aside. Let's see what other engines we have. Uh, we have the Sparrow, which puts out 15 kilonewtons. That's a tiny, tiny little engine. Uh, but if I switch this to MUN, that still gives us a thrust to weight of 2.77. That's good. So this craft should be able to land on the moon just fine. Okay, so now we've got to build a rocket that will deliver all of this into a low moonar orbit. So we'll attach another decoupler and start building our second stage. Let's see. Uh, we'll throw some fuel under that. Okay. Throw an engine under that. We'll do the swivel this time. Because the swivel puts out 215 kilonewtons uh, in vacuum, whereas the Sparrow just puts out 15. So that still gives us a thrust to weight of 2.34. Let me see if I can put a bit more under that. Put a bit more fuel. Okay, so that gives us a delta V of 2,281 for the uh, second stage. Yeah, that's plenty. Now we have to build the first stage. So again, we'll throw a decoupler under that. Okay, and 
and there's something wrong with our staging, so we'll reset that, okay. So first stage, second stage, rocket, third decoupling, okay. And there is a problem, we are overweight. So our current uh, launch pad cannot take a craft heavier than 18 tons. Okay, so we'll just rename this craft, we'll call it um, OBT Orbit uh, Mun Lander. We'll save that. And we'll just go upgrade our um, upgrade our launch pad because 18 tons is tiny, tiny, tiny. We really need a bit more. So that costs 50,000 credits. That'll do. What do we have here? Tracking station upgrade required for flight planning. We really need some flight planning. So 150,000 credits that costs. So we still have 216,000 credits left in the bank. That should be enough. Back we go. <clears throat> okay, so that gives us our rocket. So our first stage at this point has a thrust to weight of 1.1, uh, which isn't very much. Although, mind you, the uh, mind you, the uh, the moon rocket that actually took astronauts to the moon had a very small thrust to weight ratio on takeoff. Uh, but thanks to its um, very, very thirsty engines, it was able to get rid of a whole lot of that weight very quickly. Anyway, so our swivel by itself is not going to cut it. And uh, I really don't want to make this thing any taller, so we'll try building laterally. Okay. So we'll try like that. Okay, that raises our thrust to weight to 1.8. That is plenty. Just put them together like that. Okay. Good stuff. Now, uh, we'll need to cap those ends. Do that. Okay. So these three rockets will fire first. They'll decouple. And then... The center rocket will fire, and that'll decouple, and then finally this will decouple, and the parachute will deploy. Okay. Um, I'm not really liking having three swivels, because swivels are not really that uh, efficient in atmosphere. You can see the swivel has 250 uh, ISP, 250 seconds of ISP in atmosphere and 167, 168 kilonewtons in atmosphere, whereas the Reliant has 265 seconds of ISP and 205 kilonewtons in atmosphere. In fact, let me switch to atmospheric. Yeah, you can see our uh, thrust to weight drops to 1.41, which isn't actually that bad. Hmm. What I might do is, I might take away a couple of these swivels and just put Reliance on there instead. So our center engine will be the swivel and our size will be Reliance. And that raises our thrust weight to 1.97. That's very nice. Okay. Next, we want to be able to steer uh, while in the atmosphere, so I'll just throw some tail fins on there. Zoom in, okay, and then a pair like that. Hmm, not 100% on this. Okay, so our center of lift is still behind our center of mass, which is good. But once this decouples, whoops, wrong decouple. Uh, once this decouples, That's our center of mass, and our center of lift is all the way over there. Okay, so we will need some winglets to carry. There we go. That puts our center of lift behind our center of mass. This is usually what happens is, um, if your center of lift is in front of your center of mass, your rocket's going to flip over. And also, if you have an unnecessary amount of drag in the front and not enough fins in the back, your rocket's going to flip over. Okay. 
put that on. Okay, now this puts our center of lift just ahead of our center of mass. <laughs> okay, let's see if we can adjust these fins. Uh, just to put them put the center of lift a bit further back. Okay. That is very, very close. Okay, let's put this guy a little bit further back. Good, that should give us some nice stability. Now, do we... Oh good, we have the stability enhancers. What that... What one of these does is it basically just holds your rocket in place. Stops it from uh, tipping over while sitting on the launch pad. Okay, and we have exceeded our maximum parts count. We are at 40, 40 parts. Okay. So let's just save that, and let's see if we can upgrade something else to raise our parts limit. <clears throat> okay, so we'll try to... Okay, we cannot afford to upgrade our VAB. Hmm. Well, that's annoying. We may need to... What can we do? This this rocket will definitely get us to the moon. It's just that... I just rotate it. There we go. And put it nice and close to the ground. Yeah. How many parts are we at? We're, we're 10 parts over. Okay. So we need to drop some parts. We need to lose 10 parts total. Well, you know what? We're we're trying to do a flyby of the moon, right? We're not landing on it just yet. So we can take the legs off. Yep, so that drops us to 137. And if I get rid of these fins, that drops us to 33. Okay. Um, we might be able to get away with getting rid of one of these. Oops. Okay, that drops us to 32 out of 30. Hmm. <laughs> Definitely need these fins. Hmm. Well, we don't need all of these. Really, we just need... We just need them either side, like that. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, that puts us right at 30, and it's clipping in, so... Never mind, we'll just have it sit on its engines. This is um, less than desirable in the real world, but the good thing is these engines are nice and sturdy in Kerbal Space Program, so... It should be safe to launch with that. I usually never would do that, but um, part limits. Okay, and uh, let's attach some uh, Kerbal Engineer uh, module onto that so we can get some nice Delta Vs and stats. If I can find it. Okay. KER, there we go. And up two of those, just a single one. Oops, I just put three of them on. <laughs> okay. Good, so that puts us at 29 parts. Hmm. I have a nasty feeling that as soon as we get into the second stage, if we're not high enough, we're just gonna tip over. But, we'll just have to find that out. Yeah, let's get our crew on board. We'll have Valentina do this one. Good. Okay. And let's enable our RCS build aid. And as you can see, it shows two uh, center of mass indicators. One of them being the empty, and the other one being the full uh, state. But there is no torque. 
I mean, obviously it makes sense. Our engines are thrusting straight down. The total amount of force is going straight up. And this rocket is nice and balanced. Okay. Now let's check our staging. So we'll fire these rockets, decouple the first stage, fire the second stage, decouple the second stage, fire the third stage, and this will be on our re-entry. I think that's it. Do we have any concerns from the engineer? We cannot transmit science. Okay, well we have one more part to attach, but we don't actually need to transmit science. We can just recover that when we return. Okay, let's do that. Save. RCS build aid, save, and go. <laughs> okay, and we are tipping over. We're falling over. Yeah. Okay, well, um, we'll go back to the Space Center. So unfortunately, uh, Valen Val Valentina Kerman was uh, killed during that. The good thing is she is one of the immortal uh, three, so she will be able to return within a couple hours. Meanwhile, we'll just have to tell Jib that he is to uh, fly instead. And um, yeah, this time we might put on some hold down clamps. Okay. Let's see how this goes. Okay. Uh, it looks like that single clamp is just enough to keep it from toppling over, which is just as well because Jeb is our last pilot at least for a couple hours. Okay, so I'm just going to engage SAS. And I think that's about as much as we can expect. Okay. So we're going to launch in 3, 2, 1. And lift off. Just going to try to correct immediately because we went a bit south there. And now, as soon as we can, start turning towards the horizon. This is because um, whenever you are burning in the direct opposite direction of gravity, you're effectively applying an, a deceleration to yourself, which means you're wasting about 9.8 meters per second acceleration constantly. So the sooner you can get to be going horizontal, the less of that energy will be lost when you come, when you start falling back down again. By definition, once you run out of vertical velocity, you will start to fall back down again. So no matter how high you go, unless if you go into a sort of an extreme escape velocity, you will lose all of the energy you put in going up as you fall down. But if you keep going sideways, all of that energy will be preserved as you enter orbit. Okay, we're above the clouds. I'm gonna get a bit more aggressive with our ang with our angle of attack. Starting to see a little bit of flames. That's fine. A thousand meters per second at 27 kilometers altitude. We're looking good. Pushing our apoapsis out, and we have just run out of fuel. Okay, set that to prograde, and. 
Activate engine. Okay. Let's push our apoapsis out to about 150 kilometers altitude. There we go. Okay, now let's go to our map and add a maneuver node to circularize. Oops, a bit too far. 152, close enough. Okay, so now we'll just fast forward these two minutes. Okay, a minute 30 seconds. There we go, 30 seconds to go. Five seconds, three seconds. And we'll start burning. Okay. So this will cost us about a thousand meters per second delta V, which will leave us maybe 400 left in the second stage. Uh, now, from memory, we should need about 780 to, to 800 meters per second just to reach the moon. So we will use some of our third stage um, just getting to the moon, which is fine. I believe we have about 3,800 uh, meters per second in our third stage, which should be more than enough for a simple flyby. Okay, so that is our new periapsis of 148. And our apoapsis is 161. That is good enough. Now let's select the Mon as our target and plot a course of intercept. Okay. There we go. So we'll push that out to about here. Very nice. So notice what will happen is we'll go out there and the moon will be behind us. See if I hover over the encounter, the moon will be behind us, which means its gravity will pull on us in the opposite direction of travel. So it will effectively slow us down and we'll fall back down to Earth at a periapsis of 170 kilometers apparently. But yeah, it won't. See if I move further back, it means that we our periapsis gets higher to you know, nearly 700 kilometers altitude. So we want to go as close as we possibly can like that. That drops our periapsis back down to 200 Ks again. Okay, so that maneuver node is in two minutes and 40 seconds. So we'll just fast forward that, to that. There we go. Okay, one minute, 50 seconds. Okay, down to 30 seconds. 10. Okay. I'll just turn ourselves back to prograde and fire up. Now we're almost out of fuel in this second stage. And we have engine cut out. Detach and ignition of the third stage. As it turns out, we had about 3,200 meters per second in the third stage, which should still be plenty. Um, now we just uh, wait patiently while this stage um, burns. Apparently, we'll need another 70 seconds to go. So while we wait, Let's read some trivia about the space race to get to the moon. So, Khrushchev pressured Korolev to quickly produce greater space achievements in competition with the announced Gemini and Apollo plans. Rather than allowing him to develop his plans for a crewed Soyuz spacecraft, he was forced to make modifications to squeeze two or three men into the Vostok capsule, calling the result Voskhod. Only two of these were launched. Voskhod 1 was the first spacecraft with a crew of three who could not wear spacesuits because of size and weight restrictions. 
Alexei Leonov made the first spacewalk when he left Voskhod 2 on March 8, 1965. Okay, we're starting to approach, so I'll just do some fine tuning here. So take our apoapsis just out there so it can reach the month. So I'm just going to kill our maneuver node. So, so we can see the intercept. There we go. Okay, so that gives our periapsis of 192 kilometers on return. That's fine. I'm just going to focus on the moon. And our apoapsis, sorry, our periapsis over the moon will be 1.6 thousand kilometers. So I'll just burn a little bit more to get ourselves a little bit closer. No particular reason, really. I just like to have a closer view of the moon. There we go. 734. Good. Uh, what's ha what has happened is uh, I've blown up our periapsis on our way back, but that's fine. We'll do another corrective burn once we're closer to the moon. <clears throat> and we are on our way. There's the moon and we're headed straight towards it. Uh, there's nothing really else we need to do except just wait until the moon's gravitational influence is greater than that of the Earth, or of Kerbin, and it will catch us, so to speak. So we have just achieved some first milestones. We've broken a speed record of 2,500 meters per second. Good, I guess. <laughs> Okay, so we'll start fast forwarding. Let me just check how much time we have on the tail intercept. We have four hours and 53 minutes to intercept. So I'll just give us an alarm. So SOI change, which is in four hours, 50 minutes. Good enough. <clears throat> so we'll start, start fast forwarding. There we go. Okay, now where were we? Ah, yes, Alexei Leonov. So he was the first uh, spacewalk. He did the first spacewalk when he left the Voskhod 2 on March 8th, 1965. He was almost lost in space when he had extreme difficulty fitting his inflated spacesuit back into the cabin through the airlock and the landing error forced him and his crewmate to be lost in dangerous woods for hours before being found by the recovery crew. The start of manned Gemini missions was delayed a year later than NASA had planned, but 10 largely successful missions were launched in 1965 and 1966, allowing the US to overtake the Soviet lead by achieving space rendezvous uh, with Gemini 6A and docking Gemini 8 of two vehicles, long duration flights of 8 days Gemini 5 and 14 days Gemini 7, and demonstrating the use of extravehicular activity to do useful work outside a spacecraft, which was done for Gemini 12. The USSR made no manned flights during this period, but continued to develop its Soyuz craft and secretly accepted Kennedy's implicit lunar challenge, designing Soyuz variants for lunar orbit and landing. They also attempted to develop the N-1, a large man manned moon-capable launch vehicle similar to the US Saturn V. As both nations rushed to get their new spacecraft flying with men, the intensity of the competition caught up to them in early 1967, when they suffered their first crew fatalities. On January 27th, the entire crew of Apollo 1, Gus Grissom, Ed White and Roger, Roger, Roger Chaffee were killed by suffocation in a fire that swept through their cabin during a ground test approximately one month before their planned launch. On April 24th, the single pilot of Soyuz 1, Vladimir Komarov, was killed in a crash when his landing parachutes tangled after a mission cut short by electrical and control system problems. Both accidents both accidents were determined to be caused by design defects in the spacecraft, which were corrected before manned flights resumed. The U.S. succeeded in achieving President Kennedy's goal on July 20th, 1969, with the landing of Apollo 11. Neil Armstrong, Neil Armstrong 
and Buzz Aldrin became the first men to set, on the foot, set foot on the moon. Six such successful landings were achieved through 1972, with one failure on Apollo 13. The N-1 rocket suffered four catastrophic unmanned launch failures between 1969 and 1972, and the Soviet government officially discontinued its manned lunar program on June 24, 1974, when Vladimir Glushko, sorry, when Valentin Glushko succeeded Korolev as general spacecraft designer. Both nations went on to fly relatively small, non-permanent manned space laboratories, Salyut and Skylab, using their Soyuz and Apollo craft as shuttles. The US launched only one Skylab, but the USSR launched a total of seven Salyuts, three of which were secretly Almaz military manned reconnaissance stations, which carried defensive cannons. Manned reconnaissance stations were found to be a bad idea since unmanned satellites could do the job much more cost-effectively. The United States Air Force had planned a manned reconnaissance station, the Manned Orbital Laboratory, which was cancelled in 1969. The Soviets cancelled Almaz in 1978. In a season of de detent, the two competitors declared an end to the race and shook hands literally on July 17, 1975, with the Apollo-Soyuz test project, where the two craft docked and the crews exchanged visits. Okay, how are we doing? So I'm just going to accelerate time a little bit more and see if we can get onto our moon intercept. Hello, we've gone into the dark. I believe, yes, we have a Kerbin eclipse. Would that be a Kerbal eclipse? Kerbar ex eclipse? Kerbin eclipse, I suppose, is good enough. We'll just keep fast forwarding and we should get to see a Kerbal sunrise. There we go, coming up. And it's coming along. There we go. Beautiful. Okay, we'll just turn right around and the moon is getting nice and big in the window. Coming up. And there we go. Kerbal alarm clock is now slowing down time for us. So we can be uh, three minutes ahead of the uh, of the target itself. So the alarm time, blah, blah, blah. Delete on close. Close alarm, please. Kerbal alarm clock is awesome for this. So now we'll add another alarm clock at the periapsis. Uh, ba, 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 ba. There isn't one. Okay, so we'll just add a maneuver node at the periapsis. And we'll add an alarm for the maneuver. There we go. And we might adjust this to see if we can lower our periapsis on our way back. We'll just burn in this direction. Just watching that. 300,000. There we go. So we'll get our periapsis down to about 65. Uh, actually, 60 should do. Because we don't have a heat shield and we really don't want to burn up uh, through coming through the atmosphere, but we also want to use as much of the atmosphere as we can for what we like to call arrow breaking. Okay. So our maneuver is now in 1 hour and 53 minutes. Now let's go back to the various space programs. Let's see, the Apollo program was the third manned spaceflight program carried out by NASA. The program's goal was to orbit and land manned vehicles on the moon. The program ran from 1969 to 1972. Apollo 8 was the first manned spaceflight to leave Earth orbit and orbit the Earth's moon on December 21st, 1968. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin became the first men to set foot on the moon during the Apollo 11 mission on July 20th. The Skylab program's goal was to create the first space station of NASA. The program marked the last launch of the Saturn V rocket on May 19, 1973. Many experiments were performed on board, 
including unprecedented solar studies. The longest manned mission of the program was Skylab 4, which lasted 84 days. From November, from November, excuse me, from November 16, 1973 to February 8, 1974, the total mission duration was 2,249 days, with Skylab finally falling from orbit over Australia on July 11, 1979. We'll just activate uh, time acceleration. And there we go. We are now inside the moon's um, sphere of influence, and it looks like we're getting some notifications. Let's see. So we have completed our first uh, contract parameter, which is to fly by the moon. Let's uh, talk about close encounters. Any closer, and there would be paperwork. And we have some world first milestones. Um, we have initiated the first flyby of the moon, that's 26,000 credits. We have escaped the gravitational influence of Kerbin, 26,400 credits. Very nice. Okay, so we still have another hour and 45 minutes before our periapsis burn <coughs> over the moon. So I'll just go back to the Space Center and let's see if we have any more jobs that have opened up as a result of our recent achievements. and our Space Center appears to be underwater. This is a bug. So we'll just go into uh, the tracking station and come back out again. Unfortunately, sometimes this happens with um, with these mods that uh, make the game much prettier. Unfortunately, they also um, have their own share of gremlins. There we go. Okay, now let's have a look at our mission control. What do we have? We have surveys, um, haulage, science data from space around Kerbin. Um, yes, sure, absolutely. Just, uh, just to spell this one out. So we need to transmit or recover scientific data from space around Kerbin. Totally dead easy. We can do that on our way back. Just have to remember to do it. Okay, next. Um, test Rovmax Model S2 at the launch site. Okay. Uh, we can definitely do that, but I'm not really sure if it's even worth our time. Um, this will give us about five, just uh, just over 6,000 credits. So we need to test Space Y uh, 09S solid rocket booster at the launch site, another 6,000 or so. Decouplers, haulage, okay. We don't want to be to doing tourist drives yet, we don't have the comms ability um, <laughs> okay well we can definitely test these things at the launch site so we'll just accept those okay uh, the parachute while in flight over Kerbin so we need to be doing 3,000 to 8,000 kilometers sorry 3,000 to 8,000 meters altitude doing from 70 to 180 meters per second okay and that'll give us about 30,000 credits don't really want to bother with that. Uh, can we test the Juno engine? Do I splash down? I suppose we can. Uh, and observational surveys. I might accept the observational surveys. Oh, except these are above 17 kilometers altitude. We cannot get there without a rocket. So we'll just leave that for now. Now we do have enough credits now to upgrade our vehicle assembly building. And our astronaut complex. Yes, yes, we should upgrade that. Good. Okay, so now, hopefully, we can go right back to Jeb and have him perform an EVA while doing a flyby of the moon. <clears throat> okay, let's see what we can do. There's, uh, there's Kerbin in the distance and there's the moon. Okay, so EVA, there you are, and we'll just space to let go, activate his headlights, there we go, and there we have it, our very first EVA. Perform all science. 
You have recorded observations about the situation. Okay. Let's get back inside. Okay, it looks like we've got a little bit of a rotational angular velocity in the craft, so we just have to catch up to it. Grab and board. Yes, please. There we go. Okay, so now we'll just fast forward to get to our maneuver node. <clears throat> Go. Wonderful. Look at that. Okay, delete and close the alarm, please. Lovely. And while we're doing that, I might perform another EVA. So we are about 2 minutes 20 seconds away from our burn. Just double checking. Good. Okay. Just fast forward a little bit more. And a little bit more. Okay, one minute to go. 20 seconds, 10. Okay, engine ignition. And away we go. I'm just watching this valley over here. We want to drop that to what we had planned, about 60 kilometers altitude. Okay, 200,000. Start throttling that down. There we go. Just under 59 Ks, which is just fine. <clears throat> Okay, now we want to set an alarm to go off just above the atmosphere, so just before we hit it. So we'll add a maneuver node here, and then we'll add an alarm for the maneuver node, which is 16 hours away. Very nice. Okay, and that is our very first successful flyby of the moon. And of course, once we get to that node, we'll have to uh, we'll have to get Jeb to uh, do another EVA and collect some more data around Kerbin. And now back to our trivia, of course, brought to us by Wikipedia. The space shuttle, <coughs> although its pace slowed, space exploration continued after the end of the space race. The United States launched the first reusable spacecraft, the Space Shuttle, on the 20th anniversary of Gagarin's flight, April 12, 1981. On November 15, 1988, the Soviet Union duplicated this with an unmanned flight of the only Buran-class shuttle to fly, its first and only reusable spacecraft. It was never used again after the first flight. Instead, the Soviet Union continued to develop space stations using the Soyuz craft as the crew shuttle. Sally Ride became the first American woman in space in 1983. Eileen Collins was the first female shuttle pilot and with shuttle mission STS-93 in July 1999, she became the first woman to command a U.S. spacecraft. The United States continued missions to the ISS and other goals with the high-cost shuttle system which was retired in 2011. are we doing okay so there's the moon behind us and we are on our way back home so we'll just start fast forwarding again it looks like we have some notifications 
some milestones. We have escaped the gravitational influence of the money. Cool. Excellent. Free money. Okay, so we'll fast forward some more. And there comes Kerbin. Okay, I'm not sure what those visual ar artifacts are about. I'm guessing that's the ocean just clipping in. Anyway, so we'll delete this alarm. And we'll turn to retrograde. Now what we'll do is during our first um, during our first air brake pass, we'll just have our engines still attached. So we won't stage just yet, but we might burn them just, um, just at our periapsis. So we will add, we'll kill this node and add a node to periapsis and just burn to retrograde. Until we drop down to about 35 k's. Oops, too much. 17. 25 should do, in fact. Okay. It looks like we're about to get a lunar eclipse. We're just about to fly through the shadow of it. Which is cool. Add an alarm, there we go. It's like it's just gonna be a partial eclipse. Cool. Okay, coming up to our retrograde burn. One minute thirty to go. Oh wow, these artifacts really have Gotten bad, okay. This doesn't happen every time, I'm not sure why it's happening this time around, but... Oh well. <clears throat> okay... There we are. And just... Engines fire. Okay, dropping our apoapsis. Nice and steady. Okay, we are now inside the atmosphere. Might do an EVA just as we're on the outer edges. There we go. Very nice. That's just given us a little bit of extra... A little bit of extra science. Okay, I thought I locked those engines again. Okay. So what I'm doing at the moment is I'm just burning retrograde just to bleed off as much speed before we hit the thickest parts of the atmosphere. And let me just kill this maneuver node, we don't need that anymore. So we're about 25 seconds away from periapsis, which has dropped to about 56k's, which is fine. Okay, our apoapsis is at about 1,300 kilometers, which is still very, very high. But it looks like we may be able to bleed off enough speed in this one pass. We will not bounce out of the atmosphere. Hopefully. Okay, we are at periapsis, and now we are no longer descending, we're now ascending out of the atmosphere. We'll be, we'll be loose in about 95 seconds. Okay. Our apopsis is just under 600,000 Ks. Still furiously burning at full throttle. We may have skimmed the atmosphere a little bit too shallow, which is just fine. Um, I really didn't want to burn up on our way back. Okay, our apoapsis is 250 kilometers. 200 kilometers. 150. Come on. 100 kilometers. 
there we have it. 75 kilometers. Beautiful. We have achieved re-entry. Okay. So now, before this thing becomes a liability, we need to jettison it. So I'll just twist ourselves sideways, because we don't want to fly into it. And let it go. Turn to retrograde. There we have it. And now we drift. We should descend somewhere. I'm not entirely sure. Wasn't really too fussed about where we're going to land, but there's not really much left of a craft to recover anyway. So, usually what you want to do is you want to recover as much of your craft as possible just to get your money back. But uh, this particular rocket is pretty cheap, uh, relatively speaking, and we've already discarded most of it through staging. So let's see what else we can find about our trivia. Let's see, the International Space Station. Recent space exploration has proceeded to some extent in worldwide cooperation, the high point of which was the construction and operation of the International Space Station, or ISS. At the same time, the international space race between smaller space powers since the end of the 20th century can be considered the foundation and expansion of markets of commercial rocket launches and space tourism. The United States continued other space exploration, including major participation with the ISS, Okay, Jib, settle down. Including major participation with the ISS with its own modules. It also planned a set of unmanned Mars probes, military satellites, and more. The Constellation Space Program, began by President George W. Bush in 2004, aimed to launch a next-generation multifunction Orion spacecraft by 2018, a subsequent return to the Moon by 2020, to be followed by manned flights to Mars. But the program was cancelled in 2010 in favor of encouraging commercial U.S. manned launch capabilities. Russia, a successor to the Soviet Union, has high potential but smaller funding. Its own space programs, some of a military nature, perform several functions. They offer a wide commercial launch service while continuing to support the ISS with several of their own modules. They also operate manned and cargo spacecraft, which continue after the U.S. space shuttle program ended. They're developing a new multifunction PPTS manned spacecraft for use in 2018 and have plans to perform manned moon missions as well. The program aims to put a man on the moon in the 2020s, becoming the second country to do so. The European Space Agency has taken lead in commercial unmanned launches since the introduction of Ariane 4 in 1988, but is in competition with NASA, Russia, Sea Launch, China, India and others. The ESA designed man sh manned shuttle Hermes and space station Columbus were under development in the late 80s in Europe. However, these projects were cancelled, and Europe did not become the third major space power. The European Space Agency has launched various satellites, has utilized the manned space lab module aboard US shuttles, and has sent probes to comets and Mars. It also participates in the ISS with its own module and the unmanned cargo spacecraft ATV. Currently, ESA has a program for development of an independent multifunction manned spacecraft, CSTS, scheduled for completion in 2018. Further goals include an ambitious plan called the Aurora program, which intends to send a human mission to Mars soon after 2030. A set of various landmark missions to reach this goal are currently under consideration. The ESA has a multilateral partnership and plans for spacecraft and further missions with foreign participation and co-funding. ESA is also developing Galileo program, which seeks to give independence to the EU from the American GPS. <coughs> China. Since 1956, the Chinese have had a space program which is aided early on, which was aided early on from 1957 to 1960 by the Soviets. They were provided missile technology experts and missiles to study from. In 1965, plans were made to launch a human into space by 1979. And in 1967, the plans were made for a four-human spacecraft. 
East is Red was launched on April 24th, 1970, and was the first satellite to be launched by the Chinese. In 1974, the plan for human spaceflight was scrapped when policymakers decided that application satellites were more important and competing with the USA and USSR wasn't as important. In late 86, the 863rd project was started which had a focus on military applications, but also had a goal for human spaceflight. Despite, but this, despite possessing less funding than ESA or NASA, the People's Republic of China has achieved manned spaceflight and operates a commercial satellite launch service. There are plans for a Chinese space station and a program to send unmanned probes to Mars. China's first attempt at a manned spacecraft, Shu Guang, I do apologize, I must have butchered this one, Shu Guang was abandoned after years of development, but on October 1950, sorry, on October 2000, Okay. On October 15, 2003, China became the third nation to develop an indigenous human spaceflight capability when Yang Liwei entered orbit aboard Shenzhou 5. The U.S. Pentagon released a report in 2006 detailing concerns about China's growing presence in space, including its capability for military action. In 2007, China tested a ballistic missile designed to destroy satellites in orbit, which was followed by a U.S. demonstration of a similar capability in 2008. Okay, we're starting to bite into that atmosphere. It should be safe to disable SAS. There we go. Okay, 38 kilometers up. Looking good. Japan. Japan's space agency, the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, is a major space player in Asia. While not maintaining a commercial launch service, Japan has deployed a module on the ISS and operates an unmanned cargo spacecraft, the H-2 transfer vehicle. JAXA has plans to launch... Jibidai is being a bit chattery here. This is a f these sounds uh, from the crew and so on are provided by uh, a mod called Chatterer. It's really cool. It adds a nice bit of depth uh, to the game. So JAXA has plans to launch a Mars flyby probe. Their lunar probe, Selene, is touted as the most sophisticated lunar exploration mission in the post-Apollo era. Japan Habay Hayabusa probe was mankind's first sample return from an asteroid. Icaros was the first operational solar sail. Although Japan developed the Hope X, Kanho Maru, and Fuji manned capsule spacecraft, none of them have been launched. Japan's current ambition is to deploy a new manned spacecraft by 2025 and to establish a moon base by 2030. How are we doing? Okay, we're still 18 kilometers up and we're landing in the middle of the dark. No idea where the terrain is, so it is now safe to deploy our parachutes, so I'm just going to do that right away. Obviously, there's no mountains um, as tall as 10 kilometers on Kerbin, but j nevertheless, as soon as it's safe to deploy our parachutes, we'll just do that. Taiwan. The National Space Organization, formerly known as the National Space Program Office, and the National Chungshang in Institute of Science and Technology are the national civilian space agencies of the democratic industrialized developed country of Taiwan under the auspices of the Ministry of Science and Technology in Taiwan. The National Chungshang Institute of Science and Technology is involved in designing and building Taiwanese nuclear weapons hypersonic missiles, spacecraft, and rockets for launching, satellites while the International Space Organization is involved in space exploration, satellite construction, and satellite development as well as related technologies and infrastructure, including the FORMASAT series of Earth observation satellites similar to NASA, along with DARPA, such as Google Earth, and so forth. And related research in astronautics, quantum physics, material science, and microgravity aerospace engineering, remote sensing, astrophysics, atmospheric science, information science, design and construction of indigenous Taiwanese satellites and spacecraft, launching satellites and space probes into low Earth orbit. Additionally, a state-of-the-art manned spaceflight program is currently in development in Taiwan and is designed to compete directly with the manned programs of China, United States and Russia. Active research is currently undergoing in the development 
and deployment of space-based weapons for the defense of national security in Taiwan. Okay, we are almost on the surface. We are at 360 meters altitude. I still can't make out what's beneath us, but I guess we'll find out shortly. Do we have any city lights in the distance? City lights, of course, being provided by another mod called EVE and Copernicus as well. Okay, it looks like we're going to land in the middle of absolutely nowhere. Just checking. So apparently the biome beneath us is water, so it looks like we're going to land right in the middle of the ocean. This would be a problem if we do it in real life on the Earth, because you could be cast adrift and lost for ages, but uh, Kerbal Space Program is a lot more forgiving. Wherever you land on Kerbin, uh, consider it a mission success, so long as you, of course, you don't die on impact. So we're now sitting at 100 meters altitude. Do we have enough time for another bit of trivia? I don't think so. Okay, 60 meters altitude. 50, 40, 30, 20, 10, and splashdown. There we go. Okay, Jeb, you get out and do the honors. Perform all signs, please. Okay, no signs. Fine. And recover our vessel. Okay, we have gathered 52.7 science during that expedition. Uh, we've recovered some parts, which is nice. And Jeb has gained two experience points, but not enough to gain a second star. We have a bunch of messages. So we've completed our trip from the moon. They're amazed at us. A return trip from the moon. Is this mission log right? Incredible. We've taken our first steps towards exploring the moon. Let's keep going and see where it takes us. Reward of 104,000 credits. Um, recent the recent accomplishments of our space program have attracted contributions from numerous organizations. We've returned home from a flyby of the moon, and we've gathered the first scientific data from the moon. Science data from space around Kerbin. We've just received experimental data from space around Kerbin. Good work. 18,700 credits. Good, good. Okay, let's have a look at... Oh, no, we're actually out of time. I'm, of, I'm afraid I've gone way over time for this particular episode. So I do appreciate you watching, and uh, we'll just leave it there, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.